All right, well, welcome everyone to the final panel of the day on carbon management. My name is Sarah Saltzer. I'm the managing director of the Stanford Center for Carbon, um, carbon Storage and also helping to um, um, organize some of the carbon management activities here at Stanford. We've got a neat panel for you today. Uh, we've got three speakers. We've got Allison Hoyt, who's an assistant professor of Earth System Science. We've got Tony Kovsek, a professor of Energy Resources Engineering. And Connor Nolan, a postdoctoral fellow from the Woods Institute for the Environment. So to uh, kick things off, I'm just going to say a few words. But uh, each presenter will be speaking for 15 minutes. And we're going to ask you to hold your questions to the very end, where we'll have a panel where you can ask any of your questions. And I'll just ask one question to get it all started. But carbon management is a really very, very broad space. And actually, many of the panel sessions that we've already had today have covered many of the areas that are within the carbon management landscape. And when we think of carbon management, we can think of it as atmospheric restoration, getting the greenhouse gas out of the atmosphere. That can en encompass either point source carbon capture or direct air capture. It can also involve um, not just CO2, but methane or N2O or other items. And it, it can also involve natural climate solutions. And then, of course, once we get the greenhouse gases out, we need to figure out what are we going to do with them or are we going to dispose of them. So that's where carbon conversion, utilization, geologic storage all come into play. And then what ties it all together is systems modeling. In terms of the carbon management landscape at Stanford, we actually have activities going on in all of these different areas. And this slide just highlights the simple count of the number of faculty of the number of faculty that are doing work in each of these areas. And you can see just from this that we've got a quite, a, quite a bit of faculty doing quite a bit of work in these areas. We also have various programs, centers, um, initiatives, and things that have been set up to cover some of these areas, um, the research going on in some of these areas. For example, we've got SunCat. We had a lot of them up on the stage in the last panel dealing with carbon conversion and convert and utilization. We have the Stanford Center for Carbon Storage dealing obviously with geologic uh, storage of CO2. And we've got the Woods Institute, Natural Capital Project, and the Center for Ocean Solutions, which all deal with uh, natural climate solutions. And tying it all together again is the Energy Modeling Forum dealing with systems modeling. Uh, point source carbon capture, direct air capture, and um, methane and N2O uh, removal are all going to be part of the new Door School Accelerator first destination focus area, which was announced just a couple of year, uh, weeks ago. And of course, the solution space that the, that the uh, focus area will be covering is not just um, engineering. It's also going to cover uh, natural solutions. And the focus will be on technical, financial, and policy gaps. And next year, hopefully, we will hear some of the um, neat and interesting research that comes out of this new destination focus area for the school. Carbon conversion and carbon utilization were discussed both in the last panel, but also in some of the panels this morning. And I did want to mention that tomorrow morning there will be a panel that does a lot of the energy systems modeling that we do here at Stanford. So what we're going to focus on today is two remaining areas in the landscape, geologic storage of CO2 and natural climate solutions. So the speakers for this session in the correct order this time are Tony Kovsek, Connor Nolan, and then Allison Hoyt. So I'd like to start by inviting Tony Kovsek up to the stage to talk about risk assessment of geologic carbon storage. So uh, I'm going to talk to you about really sort of a workflow that we've been using to understand uh, actually specific sites where we might want to uh, store carbon. And we're working in sort of two geographical areas, the Gulf of Mexico and in uh, the San Joaquin Valley. So I'm going to uh, talk to you mainly about the San Joaquin Valley uh, because uh, I had a lot of slides ready to go. So there are, uh, you know, there, there are a whole host of risks that could be associated with uh, geological carbon storage, GCS. Uh, the, probably the primary risk in uh, the San Joaquin Valley is leakage along an existing well bore, as you see on the, you know, the, the two wells sort of on the left of your, of the slide there. Uh, 
There also is possibility for induced seismicity, so earthquakes, and then slip along you know, the, the pre-existing faults uh, that you see uh, sort of in the middle of the, middle of the figure. Uh, and then, of course, there's undesired plume migration. Here it's showing plume migration upward. It also could be plume migration uh, out of sort of the area of interest for you. So we have a top-down workflow, and I'll, I'll take you through it at a pretty high level, but it, it's, uh, it consists of uh, site selection and then regional techno-economics, uh, some collection of background information to understand uh, seismicity in the area, uh, storage reservoir engineering, and we believe it's important to do uh, coupled flow and mechanical calculations, uh, especially if you're interested in things like induced seismicity, and then basically leakage and, and seismicity risk uh, assessment. So I'll show you the kind of the end result here of a, of a, of a relatively uh, full set of uh, site selection criteria. So this, uh, again, is the, you know, the southern end of the San Joaquin Valley. You can see the city of Fresno sort of up at the top, and uh, Bakersfield is hidden there in, the, in all of the green. So uh, what we have done here is screen for uh, location of faults, screen for past location of earthquakes, uh, screened for sensitive habitats, parks, uh, you know, national historical kind of sites. And the remainder here is what you see in, in, in green is uh, potential saline formations, and the red and the gray are, uh, are, are oil fields. So there are, there's gigaton potential here in the, in the San Joaquin Valley. So the, uh, the next step is to, you know, do some techno-economics. There are a lot of incentives now for, um, you know, for storing CO2, and this is a, a kind of one, of one of the results here. We use a tool called uh, SimCCS. Uh, there's a commercial version of that. There's also a, a basically a publicly available version of that. And what you need to see or know here is that in the, C, in the SimCCS language, uh, things that are like negative, so like you see the red, that's a negative cost, so that's actually revenue, right? So it's net revenue. Um, so the scenario on the left is the so-called cap mode, where we have decided to basically collect and store all of the point source emissions in our area of interest, which is Kern County and the LA Basin, and on the right, is a scenario where we want to maximize revenue. So both of these uh, scenarios actually make money. You can see in red, uh, in this cap mode, uh, it's about $320 million of revenue, and then the, the, the price mode, which has been optimized, is a little under a billion dollars of, of revenue. So uh, the difference in what's stored is the cap stores about 40 million tons per year of CO2, and the, and the price mode stores about 20 million tons of CO2. So that's a lot of CO2 that's being stored regardless. Um, so you know, this is a prospective area to, to store CO2 is the, is the answer. So in terms of you know, some of the other things that we do, uh, we want to collect background information on seismicity. So this is a, a site that we've identified. Uh, the first circle is a radius of 10 kilometers around sort of that site. Uh, on here you see earthquakes uh, indicated by uh, the red circles. And the bigger the circle, the bigger the earthquake. So about the maximum around here is maybe magnitude 5 uh, or so. Uh, there's also faults, so you see the numbered faults in there, and we've, I won't show you this, but we've considered, uh, you know, slip on those faults. So, um, sort of, now that we've sort of characterized the site, uh, a fair amount of storage reservoir engineering uh, we've done. So I'm showing you here on the left uh, a compilation of a bunch of uh, simulations. So on the y-axis is the size of the CO2 plume, and then on the x-axis is the pressure buildup. So 
you know, if you want to minimize risk, you want to be down in the lower left-hand corner of there, right? So small plume size, small pressure uh, buildup. The view on the right is a view of the storage formation, a cross-section through it, so you can see the injector well. So it's actually, it's a, it's a horizontal well, so it comes down and it actually goes, the well goes down dip through the bottom of the, bottom of the formation. And the red is uh, the CO2 content, the CO2 saturation, and this is actually at the end of injection, which in this project is 20, actually it's 18 years. Um, and so you can see the CO2 is all uh, in the bottom of the formation. It's all a nice compact, uh, you know, a nice compact plume. Uh, the arrow on the bottom indicates, you know, a, a six-mile transect. Um, so this is pretty close to our best case that you uh, that you see there. Okay. So from this best case scenario, we can uh, make an estimate of what the plume looks like on the surface. So you see on the left, the, the solid blue line is the shape of the plume, 100 years post-injection. Uh, as I mentioned, we also do mechanics. And so uh, we're predicting, uh, so the figure on the right is uplift. It's about three centimeters of uplift or 0.18 feet. Uh, so actually the surface uh, is gonna go up. This is the, the maximum, right, because there is a, uh, an injection si uh, schedule here that has a maximum injection rate and then it's lesser over time. So this is the maximum surface deformation. Uh, again, we're looking at mechanics. We're trying to understand all of the potential risks, right? So we, we want to understand these things. Uh, also, too, in terms of monitoring, uh, the surface, you know, the actual, what happens at the surface uh, is something monitorable uh, and is a way to tell yourself or, you know, to check your predictions and try, try to understand if your predictions are uh, actually being borne out while you're injecting CO2. So um, the, uh, the other kind of really big part of this, uh, there's two really big parts of the, of the risk assessment. Uh, first one is uh, leakage. So what we are concerned with uh, are two things. One is upward migration of CO2. We're also worried about pushing brine out of the storage formation up into an overlying, uh, overlying formation. Uh, this site, uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, it has things that are identified as underground sources of drinking water, but if you actually looked at that, nobody would want to drink that water because it's, it's really pretty saline, but it's been identified that way, so we have to treat it that way. So the, um, the model that we use here is from the National Risk Assessment um, Project, NRAP, and it takes the results from those reservoir simulations that I just showed you, and it, it takes those as input, and it calculates uh, basically the rate of escape along, uh, along well bores, uh, because you have a penetration. It also calculates uh, an, an estimate of the upward migration of fluids through the cap rock on the, on the formation, but the primary you know, conduits are, are well bores. So I'll show you some results here. The, the basic story is this, this area doesn't leak, okay? Um, so this, these are worst case scenarios where we assumed the high end of permeability along the well bores. Uh, um, you know, not a well bore that's open, but a well bore with, that's significantly damaged. And, uh, you know, you see leakage of brine and you see leakage of CO2 on the left. On the right is the uh, ratio of CO2 leaked, leaked to what you injected. Uh, and on the right-hand side of that figure on the right, it shows you the cumulative uh, CO2 injection in, in green. So uh, at 150 years, it's, it's uh, you know, the leakage rates are orders of parts per million, right? So one part in a million of CO2 that you injected, so much less than even, you know, like the upper threshold that some people suggested of like 1%. So this, you know, effectively, you know, this is not a very, this is a good place for, for uh, CO2 storage. Then, um, you know, we've done all of these uh, calculations to understand the size of the plume, to understand the deformation of the surface. We also 
layer on top of this, a seismicity assessment. And so it could take a minute to explain this figure. So on the y-axis is the distance from the injection well, and on the x-axis is time. But you see zero is kind of in the middle, so we haven't started injecting yet, so it's a look back uh, in time uh, of a few years. And what you see layered on top of this is basically the seismicity. So the circles indicate the size of the earthquakes from 1950 to present, and then the coloring gives you a sense of the, um, the ground shaking, so the seismicity rate is there, okay? So uh, this is looking up very far from the injection site, right? So we are uh, only predicting the plume to be a few kilometers, and in fact, on this figure, you see the predicted plume size with error bars uh, on, uh, you know, going from zero, right? So it's all within five kilometers, um, and all within five kilometers, there is essentially no seismicity at this site, or a very, very small amount of seismicity. So uh, that's the, you know, this is sort of the forward look here of what we expect might happen. Uh, Behind uh, this, there will be monitoring, and we are proposing a traffic light system, right? So there are different colors here to indicate how the operations should uh, continue. So uh, basically, no seismic events are green, continue injecting. Um, small seismic events, say magnitude two or less, um, you know, with some notification to the, uh, right uh, to the regulatory agencies uh, to understand what they might want to do, and then things such as, you know, the seismic events are greater than three, uh, which would mean immediately stop and, uh, and assess what you're doing, uh, and then figure out what the, what the problem is. So that's the end of the workflow, and those are my acknowledgments, and that's all that I have to say. Our next speaker is Connor Nolan, and the title of his talk is The Role of Nature in Carbon Removal Portfolios. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Thanks for the organizers. Excited to be here to talk to you. Uh, my name is Connor Nolan. I'm a postdoc in the Woods Institute, and, then, and I'm an ecologist and climate scientist, and some of the things I've been working on lately are involve nature-based solutions and carbon removal. Uh, I like to start with this kind of idea that forests are in this kind of unique place where they're kind of, they're simultaneously at risk from climate change. We have drought, heat stress, disturbance, deforestation, and forest degradation. You know, emit greenhouse gases and have been particularly thorny problems to to uh, address. But forests and nature in general can, can also have a role in contributing to climate change mitigation and adaptation. But we want to try to figure out the right size for that role and and. Um, and the enabling conditions. So the idea that forestry and nature contributes to climate change mitigation, it's not, not a new idea. I found this report from the, a pre precursor of the IPCC in 1990 talking about tropical forestry response options and coming up with some similar estimates of the kind of scale uh, that people are talking about now. And, but there was recent interest, there's been you know, interest in terms of nature representing a win-win across co climate conservation and sustainable development goals. Uh, to try to get a sense of the scale that we can expect from nature, we gathered a bunch of different estimates from the literature that we could find. So I ended up with 42 different estimates of papers. These are just a few of the titles. And we then are plotting them all on the, like, uh, as an estimate of the contribution to negative emissions from now to 2100. And we get a range of, of uh, Estimates from you know less than 100 billion tons to well over 1,000 billion tons, and so it's a really wide range. And the uh, and the orange bar here is an estimate from IPCC about the amount of negative emissions that might be needed to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. And you can see only the maximal estimates get kind of anywhere in that range, and many of the estimates are well below. Um, so to kind of parse some of these estimates, we came up, we we talk about this mental model of whether you think about the biosphere as a silo or a haystack, uh, 
If the biosphere is more like a silo, it might be limited to refilling past losses in carbon from the biosphere, from human and land use change and, and other things like that. Um, and then you might think of potential on the order of a few hundred billion tons or less. Um, but to get to these high level, high estimates of 1,000 gigatons, you've, you're really having to think about increasing carbon storage far beyond historical bounds in, in the biosphere. And this kind of with silo versus haystack framing kind of makes Im explicit some of the implicit assumptions about biogeography and biogeochemistry and management choices and the types of ve vegetation that you might want to plant. So um, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but th all th uh, this work is in, published in Nature Reviews, Earth and Environment. Um, and we also looked at what kinds of uh, constraints different estimates considered. So uh, obviously, like, uh, many of them are just purely like maximal biogeochemical potential. But some consider things like maintenance of other ecosystem services, the cost of, of implementation, social political constraints, and govern governance and financing constraints. The takeaway from this work is that like right now, governance and financing constraints are the near-term limiting factors. But in the end, biogeochemical potential do set kind of like a long-term long maximum. So how do these different constraints translate to implementable potential? I think this is a really nice study from uh, some, a group working in Southeast Asia reforestation. And they, 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 they gathered all the, a bunch of data and like remote sensing data and other data to come up with a biophysical potential. And then they added in layers of financial constraints, land use constraints, operational constraints, and found that the actual implementable potential was, uh, was well under 20% of the biophysical maximum. So this kind of illustrates the importance of these like wide range of constraints in, in, in kind of, it's not just about is it biologically feasible. So we did a deep dive into all these individual estimates, looked at some of the most highly constrained ones, used some of this back of the envelope, um, kind of a fifth or less on some of the other ones. And, and we came up with a range that natu natural climate solutions can reasonably contribute something like 100 to 200 billion tons of CO2 removal over this century. And that, that's a huge amount. It's a really, very, very meaningful amount. And it represents a huge scale up from what's currently happening. But it's nowhere near probably what the ult ultimate need for negative emissions and carbon removal is. So that leads us to like arguing for a, a portfolio approach where nature has a role, but it's kind of complemented with a lot of the other solutions as well. And a, an example that we, we like to point to as a as kind of illustrating this portfolio approach is this Livermore Lab report on getting to neutral in California. In this report, they found that California needs something like 125 million tons a year of negative emissions to, to meet state goals. And they find something like 20% of that, 25 million tons a year, could come on natural and working lands with the remainder coming from bioenergy with carbon capture and storage and some from direct air capture with CO2 storage. So this is kind of in line with what we're saying where, where nature has a role, but it's, it's, it's a part of a portfolio. And so state, local, or and national kind of action is, is like still in its relative, relatively early stages as far as carbon removal, but corporate climate plans represent kind of a proving ground for these kinds of portfolio approaches. So we, we've been working with some companies and thinking about like what the optimal kind of right sizing of nature is in their portfolio. So you know, uh, Microsoft has an ambitious goal to be carbon negative by 2030 and has been talking about their approaches. This requires, their goal of carbon negative requires a lot of like inexpensive um, carbon removal, like which often comes from nature. Um, and uh, Stripe and Google and Meta and some of these other, some other companies have joined as Frontier, which is a big advanced market commitment to accelerate permanent technological carbon removal. Um, and these are just kind of some different examples of things that are going on. Part of this, this push in the corporate sector and the new emphasis on quality has led to a move away from nature in favor of permanent technological carbon removal. And the criticisms um, kind of have been on two main fronts. One's additionality challenges and baselines, and the other is on permanence. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some work we've been doing on these. Um, and as a, as that's part of kind of like making sure nature can try to maintain a role, a play, a, a role in, in carbon portfolios and um, 
carbon markets. But these criticisms have been substantial, and they've been they've like you know represented bad press, which you know, no companies want the reputational risk of saying their climate investment wasn't successful. I think um, part of what I would argue is that the bad press is that na nature-based solutions have been being implemented for some number of years. So there actually is a what just a wide range and, of of quality. There doesn't mean that all nature is bad. But it just means, and there's been learning over time as these things have been implemented, and um, we can kind of, that learning doesn't have to be a crisis. Um, we can kind of, it, 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 the learning can be an example that, we're, that we have a path towards improving. So additionality, one of the main uh, challenges and criticisms uh, has two components, financial additionality, which is like what was the role of carbon financing in getting a project off the ground, and then the, uh, uh, the other part of additionality is about baselines. So what do you uh, me measure your success rate against? In an avoided deforestation project, what, what are you assuming the deforestation rate was? In a reforestation project, what, what would be the natural regrowth in, in the absence of the pro project? And these are really difficult questions to answer. It relies on an unobservable counterfactual. Um, and like, when these projects were first implemented, we didn't have remote sensing and other things, so projects relied on relatively weak baseline standards, like just assuming zero regrowth or assuming re regional average deforestation rates. And that has led to some potential overcrediting. But now, as, as advancements in um, standards have started, we started getting backward-looking match controls, which help like to deal with these overcrediting. And going forward with the new remote sensing and machine learning techniques, we, there's a potential for di truly dynamic match controls where projects don't even know, are, may not even know their baseline in advance. They are, they'll be measured tr truly with what they did that is observable and different from other projects on the ground, which is, to me, an exciting path towards quality in this space. And the idea that na nature relies on a counterfactual and this is, again, a kind of impossible to credit well, I think it's used as a cudgel against nature, but I think counterfactuals, when you look deeply, actually underlie a lot of different carbon removal options, especially things like enhanced weathering, which involves um, adding crushed rock to agricultural fields and leading to ultimately increased carbon storage in the ocean. You need a counterfactual of what would have happened in the ocean carbon sink in, in the absence of this project, and you need to be able to measure that with high confidence. So, there's learning that it, it can be applied from the history we have with nature to these other things like enhanced weathering, and this also applies to things like ocean alkalinity enhancement. And I think there's also even things like direct air capture, which have a very clean additionality in, in, in most arguments. They may have some issues with counterfactuals in terms of what's the alternate uses of the renewable energy that goes into power these things. So kind of this dealing with counterfactuals and thinking about counterfactuals it underlies a lot of different things in climate change mitigation and carbon removal in particular. So um, we have some forthcoming work um, about defining and aligning additionality across carbon markets, uh, national inventories, and global budgets. So uh, we can, you know, that paper will be coming out before too long. Um, the other thing I'm going to talk about briefly is some work on permanence risk. Um, so permanence risk is the idea that, uh, you know, there's an argument that storing carbon in nature is inherently in impermanent because it would likely be released pre prematurely. Um, and we had a master student working on us who kind of broke up the risks in here in terms of delivery risk, which is before carbon credits were issued, and permanence risk, um, which would be after, over the kind of 100-year permanence window or whatever you want to define in a different registry. Permanence risk traditionally has been handled at at the registry level via buffer pools where projects um, put, some, put some proportion of their credits for, for a given project into a shared buffer pool. If there's a reversal event, credits from the buffer pool are retired to account for the re reversal event, and as long as the buffer pool remains solvent, the permanence claim remains intact across all projects. And if you think buffer pools, there's been criticism that the buffer pools are likely undercapitalized, and we agree with this probably, like, that there is um, kind of non-stationary risks that need to be accounted for with climate change, but they may not fundamentally be the wrong approach, and there's some um, interesting updates to the non-permanence risk tools from Vera and other registries that we think could be um, 
could help solve this, and, but we're exploring other options as well. Risk and other in, uh, industries is often handled via insurance, and buffer pools are a form of insurance or self-insurance. Uh, but there's some carbon removal insurance companies that are starting to pop up. Kida and Oka are two that we're aware of. Um, they are so far mainly focused on delivery risk that before the carbon credits are issued, but, but, before, but after um, capital is invested. But they're exploring options along with um, other insurance and reinsurance companies to develop permanence risk tools. Um, Permanence risk is kind of difficult because obviously no one's writing a 100, 100 year insurance policy, but there have been some proposals of, of writing series of short term insurance policies that may have an obligation to renew over the life of a credit or a claim, and you either renew the policy or you replace the carbon credit. Um, so, you know, the insurance industry is kind of difficult, and we've been learning a lot, but there, there's this interesting kind of first mover risk in insurance where they often may ha the first movers have to pay out big losses without the damage history they might need to under underwrite and estimate the risk accurately. And we've been working on some analogs, thinking about analogs to flood insurance and fire insurance, financial portfolio insurance, mortgage insurance. Um, we think there's potentially some interesting shared learning across these different industries. Ultimately, we want to like our key going forward in this is that with there, some entity needs to be needs to be liable for. Uh, non-delivery and non-permanent, so the atmosphere isn't left holding the risk, which is kind of where we're at now in, in some cases. So we have some forthcoming work also to explore these financial and insurance tools relevant for enabling nature and carbon removal portfolios, and it will be re relevant beyond nature. And then, yeah, lastly here, take takeaways with my email at the bottom, and I look forward to the discussion later. But takeaways are nature has a role to play, but it's only one piece of the puzzle. Counterfactuals are really underlying everything. We have to get those right. And developing systems that can incorporate new knowledge and where there's incentives to get the measurement reporting verification right um, are key. And we want to treat learning like as a way to, to improve the system, not as a crisis to, to the system. So thanks. Thank you, Connor. Okay, I'd like to invite our next speaker up, uh, Alison Hoyt, and the title of her talk is Rewetting Indonesia's Degraded Peatlands, a, Na a Natural Climate Solution. Thanks so much for having me. Um, today I'm gonna talk about tropical peatlands in Indonesia and, and the potential for um, restoring and rewetting these ecosystems. This is a joint project um, with others here at Stanford as well as our partners in Indonesia. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, peatlands are wetland ecosystems and peat itself is the organic rich soil that is formed, so below ground. And they're present all over the world and they look different in different environments. So this, for example, is one of the most well-studied um, peatlands in Canada. It's made of sphagnum moss, um, and you may even be familiar with moss used in horticultural purposes. There's uh, widespread peatlands in Scandinavia and Canada. Um, but today I'm gonna be talking about tropical peatlands, which above ground, instead of having moss, have these huge tropical rainforests. But what they have in common is that below ground on both these tropical and northern peatlands are very large carbon stocks. So this is um, a picture of a cross section where they were actually building a road, so just bulldozing right through the peat so you can get an unusual view to see um, what the peat itself looks like in these tropical peatlands. And you can see the soil is really made up of this woody, carbon-rich uh, material. And although it looks um, very intact, it actually can be thousands of years old. So, so that wood has been there and is protected by um, the anaerobic and wet conditions that um, prevent decomposition. And because of this, um, this carbon accumulation, peatlands are major carbon stores. They actually store twice as much carbon as all the world's forests below ground um, in this really deep carbon-rich soils. And um, the peat accumulates over thousands of years, as I mentioned, um, due to slow decomposition. Um, in Southeast Asia, this old peat carbon that's been forming over a long time is now being threatened by land use change. So here you can see um, the island of Borneo. It's about the size of France or Texas. Um, so a very large area in um, Indonesia and Malaysia. And you can see how the forest has, has been retreating um, over the last decades and how especially the deforestation has really been concentrated in coastal areas, which is also where a lot of the tropical peatlands are present. 
So in these areas, um, drainage typically follows deforestation. So the, the map I showed you was the receding forest with deforestation, but in these peatland ecosystems, drainage and deforestation go hand in hand. So drainage canals are often the easiest way to export logs. It's lower cost than building roads through a swamp. Um, and then drainage canals also, once deforestation has happened, lower the water level so that um, agriculture can proceed. And so here you can see some um, pictures of what that looks like across the landscape. But this also has big implications for the carbon stocks in these peatlands. So as we lower the water table through drainage, suddenly oxygen can come into the soil much more than it previously had. Um, and that speeds up decomposition and that leads to CO2 emissions and fires. So um, we've done a lot of work to quantify these um, CO2 emissions. And we found that they're huge across the region. Um, for example, they're similar in magnitude to the fossil fuel emissions from the same region. So um, in Southeast Asia, this peat degradation and disturbance is a major, major source of CO2 emissions in the region. It, the drainage also leads the peatlands to become susceptible to fire because as you saw, it's basically a pile of woody material and as soon as you dry that out, um, the chance for it to catch on fire is, is very large and you can see these are not forest fires um, as maybe we Im imagine them here in California, but it's actually the material underground that's smoldering and these fires can last for um, weeks or months. And that also leads not only to air quality impacts, but um, to another major source of CO2 emissions in the region. So again, similar um, to fossil fuel emissions. So I've been telling you all about the problems um, associated with peatland um, degradation in Southeast Asia, but now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the solution and opportunities to reduce or stop these CO2 emissions and fires. So peatland um, restoration and particularly peatland rewetting um, offers us the opportunity to stop these CO2 emissions and restore the ecosystems to their function as carbon sinks. So um, here's some data that I wanted to show you that um, underlies our rationale of why we think this is such a promising approach. So on the x-axis, you can see the water table depth. So, um, and on the y-axis is CO2 emissions. And you see that when we have, and in blue, like above zero is when we have wet conditions, so it's flooded. That's kind of how these ecosystems typically in like a natural swampy setting. And you can see the CO2 emissions are um, near zero. And then as the water table gets deeper and deeper, the emissions increase um, nearly linear linearly. So the drier the um, system, the more CO2 emissions. Um, and so this is the real motivation for our, um, the idea of re-wetting peatlands as a natural climate solution. If we can move from high emissions um, back to a low emission scenario, um, that makes a, a big difference. And one thing I also wanted to point out is that partial re-wetting can still have a big impact if we can uh, make these ecosystems a little bit wetter, but not, we don't have to fully restore them to their flooded state. We can still cut the emissions, for example, in half. So um, because this is such a promising and low cost idea, there's been um, very recently a lot of interest in it. Um, Indo Indonesia, as the government, has set up a um, peat restoration agency and they've committed to rewetting two million hectares of tropical peatlands. So a, a, a big chunk of land. And this is done um, by blocking canals. So basically putting small dams into the canals, um, which is a really low tech and low cost intervention. So it's something that local communities can run. People can um, be paid to do this. And sometimes the dams are made with local materials, other times with concrete. But in, in most cases, it's uh, relatively simple to carry out. Um, this has also been identified um, as part of a wetland pathway towards uh, natural climate solutions. 19% um, of the low cost natural climate mitigation are um, wetland pathways. And of these, um, peat restoration and avoided peat impacts are specifically highlighted. One thing I wanted to um, show here is that the size of the error bars, the uncertainty on peat restoration um, is huge. And that comes to the project that we're working on and the, the reasoning behind this is that tropical peatlands are very diverse. So in their natural state, um, the tropical peatlands look like tropical rainforests above ground and really carbon rich soils below ground. But then once they've been deforested, there's a range of different land uses that of course leads to different water tables and also different costs of restoration. So here you can see some pictures that I took in Southeast Asia. Um, on the left is a smallholder agriculture. In the middle is kind of like a 
burned and deforested area that's been largely abandoned. And on the right is a seedling oil palm plantation. So if you just imagine the, um, how people are using the land in each of those different scenarios, you can think about how restoration might, what the challenges might be associated. So in the project that we're working on here at Stanford, we're um, aiming to identify priority areas for peatland rewetting and think about where can the largest emissions be avoided most cost effectively. So given this very diverse landscape, where should we be prioritizing um, peat restoration? And to answer these, uh, this question, we're using um, data sets that have been developed by our team, particularly new remote sensing data sets. So um, the, I'm going to talk a little bit about each of them to give you a flavor of the, the type of work and the type of new data that we're developing here. Um, so these include carbon stocks, um, CO2 emissions, fire risk, and rewetting costs. And by looking at each of these um, across the landscape, then we can really pinpoint um, how, the, how the balance of costs and benefits changes in different places. So the first one is the carbon stocks, thinking about how much carbon is at stake. Um, as I showed, these peat profiles are really carbon rich, but in some places the peat is one meter deep, while in other places it's 10 meters deep. And so if you think about the time scales of, of which you're protecting this carbon, um, protecting for long time scales, you really want to target those really deep places versus if you want to think about short term um, action, then you want to think about where are the emissions highest right now, and maybe you don't care about the total depth. The second thing you want to think about is how fast is the peat carbon being lost. So as um, the peat is drained and is susceptible to being um, emitted as CO2, that's actually a loss of that underground carbon to the atmosphere. So that's unlike subsidence, for example, here in the Central Valley, um, when we see subsidence in Southeast Asia, it's actually a loss of carbon. So there you can see um, a poll where subsidence has been measured from 1979 to 2007. So the ground has sunk down all of that um, distance as a result of peatland drainage. And that's actually all carbon that was in the ground that's now um, been emitted to the atmosphere. So it's a very visual representation of the carbon stores that we're um, losing. And then what we can do is um, use remote sensing. So on the right, we have a, an example of the maps that we can generate with um, satellite for example, with INSAR remote sensing, to actually detect the subsidence rate. And from that, we can calculate how much carbon we're losing per year. So in most of the peatland areas, our typical uh, loss rate is about two centimeters per year. Um, so you can think about that as like the actual physical amount that the ground is going down, and that's how much carbon is being released to the atmosphere. Um, we also are using remote sensing um, from the SNAP uh, satellite to look at the fire risk um, by looking at soil moisture. So um, as I mentioned, fire has a huge air quality impact, as everyone here in California is aware, but also is a major source of emissions. Um, and so we're, we're mapping the, how dry the peat is and looking for thresholds. We found like very clear thresholds when the peat is likely to burn. Um, and then finally, we're thinking about how much would it cost to re-wet these peatlands. So we've generated the first um, high resolution maps of drainage canals on these peatlands. You can see they're really variable across the landscape with some areas being intensively drained and others um, not so much. And so by looking at the density of the canal network, um, we can also then calculate what the cost would look like given the certain number of canal blockages, et cetera. Um, so we're putting these all together to think about this question of how can the largest emissions be um, avoided most cost effectively by trying to minimize the cost of restoration, like the network of canals, um, and and divided by or considering the total emissions from the peatland um, oxidation as well as fire emissions. And we're also thinking about um, feasibility considerations based on the land use. So to give you an idea of um, how this plays out, we take into account the costs of restoration and then we think about the emissions from um, oxidation, so the um, decomposition of peat as well as fire. And this just gives you um, an idea of the spatial scale that we're looking at. So we can really uh, make these calculations at a very fine spatial scale so that we can then give recommendations to individual landowners uh, based on our whole map of the region um, and really um, pinpoint how these costs and benefits play out at a, a small spatial scale. We're also thinking about um, other considerations like the health impacts from PM 2.5 emitted by fire. Um, damage from fire, and then the employment benefits from dam construction. Um, we've seen a lot of communities are really excited about um, the jobs that are created from building dams. 
And finally, we also have to think um, a lot about more technical assumptions. For example, as we're looking at um, fire risk into the future, we need to think about, uh, of course, fires, um, we don't know exactly where they're gonna catch, so we need to also make assumptions um, about that and thinking about how deeply the fires will burn, how much CO2 they'll emit. So that gives you a, a, a flavor of what we're working on. We're also doing um, field campaigns to validate the greenhouse gas emissions and trace these projects before and after. So we're working with the Nature Conservancy Indonesia as well as um, Untan University in Pontianak. And actually three members of my research group are in Indonesia right now um, doing these field measurements. So um, that's all I have for today. I just wanted to share these different data sets that we're bringing together um, and hopefully um, let you know about peat rewetting as a potential strategy to substantially cut CO2 emissions. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. All right, I'd like to invite all of our speakers um, up onto the stage for panel discussion. Okay, I'm gonna just kick it off with one general question to um, everyone on the panel, but please be thinking of your own questions that can either be directed toward one individual or um, if you can come up with a question that spans all three, that would be great as well. Um, so I'll just start out with, you each talked about some carbon management solutions. Um, what do you see as some of the obstacles for scaling and or opportunities for scaling your solution? And let's start with Tony. So I, 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 I think really it's probably just public acceptance, you know, at scale there's gonna have to be a lot of CO2 going into the ground. Uh, and if you think about you know, the distribution of current CO2 emissions, you know, about 30% globally are really hard to, uh, you know, hard to avoid emissions, right? So it's still a lot of CO2. So I think it's just public acceptance of the technique. Allison? Yeah, um, as you saw, we're hoping to pinpoint um, how the challenges vary across the landscape because these areas are so diverse, but definitely the um, economic and social considerations of convincing people to change the land use, I think is one of the biggest challenges. So a lot of these areas are um, actively farmed or they're oil palm plantations, and so like convincing people to convert it back to a swampland is, is not gonna be easy. And so I think that also points to one of the biggest opportunities, which is targeting some of the lower production um, land uses, like the, about 25% of the peatland area in Southeast Asia is um, kind of, has been deforested, but is not actively used for other economic uses. And so I think that area is um, really where we should prioritize um, peat rewetting. And the other um, potential opportunity, I think, is this partial rewetting that I mentioned, where rather than trying to fully restore the area to a, a natural swampland, um, which may be less palatable, um, raise up the water table to the point where it stops fires, cuts CO2 emissions in half, but the land can still be used for farming. Awesome, Connor. Um, I guess I would say the kind of two buckets of things that are the help with scale, which one is kind of high trust measurement reporting and verification that's relatively, that kind of buyers of carbon credits trust, and, but is implementable for project developers and people on the ground. And then the other thing is really this need to develop like relationships with people on the ground. Like there's a lot of maps of the potential, global potential for XYZ solution, but that all often all, all comes down to relationships on the ground and is there the structures in, pl in place to make that happen on the ground. So make that permanent on the ground by bringing you know, economic benefit to those people directly. Awesome, okay, well I guess it's a, actually a common theme in your answers, it's the people on the ground, great. All right, I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. With a question to Connor. So just take the US for, for a moment and talk about how we can have the biggest impact, let's just say in the agroforestry space or better managing our, our forest systems in, in this country. Can you tell me both um, a recommendation on a policy and then on technology that you're most you think would have the biggest impact on trying to get to this issue of verification, measurement, and monitoring? Um, yeah, I've, I've, in the U.S., I know there's, 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 some, there's some startups and people working on uh, agroforestry in the southeast U.S. I, I know of, and some of them are working on kind of 
using iPhone LiDAR technology and stuff to, to, um, to, to be able to measure the, 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 the forest growth on their land and make it really easy for farmers to do this, but something that they have already. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I know exactly on the policy side, but I think that there are gonna be big opportunities in, in the upcoming farm bill negotiations to, to include carbon considerations and, and, and uh, like as parts of the farm bill negotiations. Uh, thank you, thank you for the great introduction. Um, so my question is mostly for Connor and Allison. You talked a lot about collaborating with nonprofits, community organizations on the ground. Where do you see the role of industry in pushing these nature-based solutions forward? And how exactly do you see you as researchers in academic setting collaborating with industry partners? Thank you. Um, so I can talk about it in the tropical peatland context. So I think there's a really big role for industry to embrace some of these practices, for example, raising the water table, because um, half of the, roughly half of the peatland area in Southeast Asia is either oil palm plantations or acacia um, pulpwood plantations. And so um, most likely those areas are going to remain um, within, within industry hands for the foreseeable future. But they are, there's no need for the water table, for example, to be a meter deep. It could easily be 50 centimeters deep. And right there, that would be a 50% reduction in emissions. And so that's something that land managers being thoughtful um, on their own lands could, could really make a difference. And there is starting to be some collaboration. For example, the April plantation um, in Sumatra is um, doing really careful monitoring and has actually um, collaborated to publish some really high impact academic papers showing what the, the potential differences there are. So I think, yeah, that's the way that academics can get involved is by um, adding more trustworthy uh, measurement and monitoring, I think. One thing I would add from the perspective of people in the industry buy, who are buy, like purchasing carbon credits is like in the nature-based space is like not just buying the cheapest carbon credits, but looking, but engaging with the project developers and see, understanding what's going on on the ground and finding projects that align with the in corporate vision of what they are looking for beyond just carbon, that, that these things are having conservation and sustainable development impact that they, that, that is meaningful. And it, yeah, it's not just finding the cheapest whatever, $1 per ton avoided deforestation project to offset your emissions, it's finding something that you feel good about and, feel, and is meaningful and is a demand signal for quality projects be, to be, continue to be developed. I can also mention there's um, another group, for example, um, the Roundtable on Sustainable Oil Palm is a group of industry partners that have come together to try to signal their interest um, in doing a better job to reduce CO2 emissions and fires. And so I think as, um, outside like an academic and nonprofit community if we can engage with those groups and try to make sure that it's not just virtue signaling but that the um, suggestions are implemented, that's also a, a place that we can make a difference. And that's um, kind of led to some, rate or happened in tandem with some regulation in Southeast Asia to, to suggest keeping the water table at 40 centimeters in peatland areas. So if those um, regulations could actually be followed um, in a widespread way that would immediately lead to a very uh, big reduction in CO2 emissions. Hi, uh, two questions for, for Tony. Um, first, it's hard to get anything built in California. And uh, I'm kind of curious on your, your non-technical view, perhaps, of, of whether we'll see meaningful carbon capture and sequestration in, in California. Um, and then the second is, you know, I'm not an expert in this area, so I've heard others say that, hey, the long-term stability of CO2, how it interacts with water, and can it be acidic and chew through rock? I, if you could just speak to some of those uncertainties, right, that are longer-term reactions that CO2 might do. Sure, so yeah, on the first topic, yeah, it is hard to get things, I think, permitted in California. Uh, that's one of the attractive features about this project and why we've actually, you know, we've attracted funding for it is because the feeling is, you know, if this project can be done here, then, you know, it's, it's really sort of like a, a keystone for a bunch of other projects that will follow. Um, because this, this, this site really, you know, um, it, it wasn't just us, right, but the people we're collaborating with, there was a lot of work to really find a site with very few well penetrations, no seismicity in the area. So, yeah, so yeah it, it, it could be tough, but we think that, you know, this would be, 
if this gets permitted, it'd be the first of many. And there are other, you know, there are other interesting places in California. There's a biorefinery uh, that may have a, may actually, there's a project that will happen there. Uh, and the attractive part of a biorefinery is you capture the CO2, those are actually negative CO2 emissions. Um, the, uh, so yeah, the, you know, the, the interesting thing, so my lab group, we also do a lot of really sort of nerdy experiments where you take rocks and torture them. Uh, so you torture them by subjecting them to acids like carb, you know, carbonic acid is, that's gonna form, as well as you know, pulling and stretching. Uh, and you know, the ultimate torture is kind of pushing on them while you're flowing acid through them. And a really interesting thing happens across this really broad set of rocks that we look at. There, there is some, you know, what people will call damage, but they actually become better seals because you have these rocks that have heterogeneities in them and the fluids tend to flow through the most permeable or the easiest to flow pathways and you dissolve features in there. But then the stresses that you put on them, which are the, similar to the stresses in the earth, actually close up those, close up those, uh, you know, close up those things and then they become actually better seals. So they actually become less, uh, less permeable to the fluids that want to move through there. The other thing I didn't tell you, but this, this site also that I talked about, there's been a lot of geological characterization. It has a thousand feet of uh, impermeable rock above that storage zone. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty, it's a, that's a lot of, you know, that's a lot of reservoir seal. Um, but yeah, these, these are all part of quite, you know, these are all important questions that need to be answered in the sort of the site characterization part of the, part of the process. I wanted to ask all of you about permanence. So mm -hmm. when we burn fossil fuels and put CO2 in the atmosphere, it's gonna stay there for hundreds or even thousands of years. So when you're talking about nature-based solutions, uh, I think these rely on assumptions about uh, changes in land use and land management. And so how do you think about confidence that those kinds of changes, even if you achieve them you know, next year in Indonesia or something, are gonna last for 100 years or 500 years, right? And then on the geological storage side, one of the criticisms that we hear is that people aren't really sure about, you know, all of this is done as modeling in risk assessment, but do you have tools that you can actually see what's happening with the plume underground once it's been injected so that, you know, we can sort of verify that those models are accurate and, and people can start to gain confidence? I, I'll, t I'll start off with, Permanence broadly, and then Allison can talk about Indonesia in particular. But I would say it's a, it's definitely a, a concern. I think, but I think nature-based solutions are kind of available now, and in and in in one so in, in one way can act as a bridge towards permanent technological carbon removal. But but and can have real benefits even if they are uh, temporary. There's been a bunch of work lately on lowering the peak, reducing the t or uh, and kind of like buying time, even if uh, nature-based solutions might not be permanent. But I would also t say that forests have been around for millions of years, and even an individual, pro uh, individual site may experience variation over time. There, we have high confidence that, that, that forests are going to keep sequestering a lot of carbon, and we, and we have an ability to affect the amount of carbon and how fast they're doing that. So I think there's, you know, that would that, be my, a couple high level points on permanence for me. Yeah. Yeah, I think the point that you mentioned is true. We, we are relying on people to continue a land management change um, indefinitely in the future if we want to see these benefits. Um, but at the same time, like Connor mentioned, I think, for example, in the case of the peatland rewetting, this is a change that we can make on the order of weeks. Like, if you put in a dam, it's raining every other day, uh, the peat re-wets and you have immediately shut off those CO2 emissions. And so I think while it does have the downside of we, we can only rely on future land managers to do as well as we're currently doing and whatever policy choices they make, it has other benefits. Um, for example, the low risk that we know that it will definitely work and it doesn't um, need any like new technology that's untested and that we could take action right away. The other point I, uh, I was going to say it was something I was talking to a project de developer lately about, is, which is they were, they were arguing that if a project, if a community sees benefit from a project, financial and 
financial benefits in particular, the project will make, keep going. So it's not necessarily relying on nature itself it, in the abstract. You're relying on a set of people in a place to do a, a task. And if they're seeing the benefit of continuing to do that, the project will keep happening. And Tony? Yeah, I'd say, you know, the measuring and, you know, monitoring and verification is going to be, plan is going to be really important for these, you know, these projects. Uh, you know, one of the ideas that we have that's emerging is I showed you the, how the, basically the surface deformed. And we think that also would be a good way to get a quick idea and be able to monitor, right? Because if you know what's happening at the surface, you have a model that you're running and you, you know, modify the model so that it matches the surface, uh, you know, deformation. That's another, you know, piece of the puzzle. In, in monitoring, but there are other, you know, I think really powerful geophysical techniques as well, like uh, distributed acoustic sensing that could be quite, quite powerful in really telling us, you know, where things are moving and, and where the fluids are moving as well as even, you know, monitoring for uh, seismicity at very, you know, small magnitudes um, so that we can adjust the process as it's you know, being carried out. Hi, a uh, question for Professor Kovsek. Um, the project you're working on in Southern California, w what are the point sources for the CO2 that you are thinking of sequestering, uh, I guess is one question. The second part of it, if these are dilute sources, uh, flue gas from, from burning fossil fuel, for example, are the technologies for capturing those like at, at a point where you, it's worth doing? Uh, yeah, right, so maybe this, the second Thing I'll say, I showed you some techno-economics, right? So we basically identified all of the point sources in the area from the EPA has a nice database. Uh, and so then the costs that were in there for capturing are actually based on the amount of CO2 that you expect in the flue gas. So, those, you know, the costs are expensive, right? But, but uh, you know, it, it, seems, it seems sort of economic. Uh, and that, the, the project that I showed, uh, it, there's a local industrial source uh, that's quite close, uh, so there doesn't have to be much of a pipeline built. Uh, extending that into capturing more, there's actually a lot of CO2 emissions in Kern County. Uh, there are there's cement plants, there are uh, like tomato canning facilities that actually use a fair amount of natural gas, so they make a fair amount of CO2. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunities there to capture those things. And that would be a more difficult process because you'd have to locate the, uh, the pipelines to bring them in. Um, but it's certainly doable. The, one of the main critics of the nature-based solutions is that the absorbed carbon dioxide eventually goes back, you know, the tree burns or dies and decomposes. So. Um, Wondering if nature-based solutions should perhaps also try to absorb methane, which also has carbon in it, right? Because it's unlikely to come back as methane if the, you know, your genetically modified soybean that digests carbon dioxide and methane equally, if it burns, it comes back out as carbon dioxide, which is less harmful. So in the long term, do you see possibilities for methane absorption rates to get increased significantly in, in nature? Um, I know, for, for example, um, thinking about how we could modify agricultural practices, which I guess is like broadly still um, nature related. So for example, in the case of rice, um, rice produces a lot of methane emissions and uh, we can reduce those emissions with practices such as alternate wetting and drying. So we, by um, lowering the water table and then flooding the rice again and then lowering it, the, during the dry periods, the methane is oxidized and or the um, methanogen community is um, suppressed. And so like those types of practices, I think, could really um, reduce methane emissions. Is that the type of thing that you're thinking about? Oh, actual. I, I, I don't think, I haven't heard of anyone working on absorption of methane in nature. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, no. But methane should absorb the carbon, right? So yeah. if you had, if you were putting, you know, like a, almost pure carbon source, it should have some, but it's gonna be proportional to what's in the atmosphere, yeah. so yeah, I think don't the, expect it to be big. The right. challenge is that the methane concentration in the atmosphere is quite low, so even 
when you have a sink for methane, um, it won't be very efficient, except for in some particular locations like uh, wetlands, but then we don't really want to drain them for other reasons. But yeah, maybe there could be some like nature-inspired engineered solution near methane and hot spots. Thanks for the suggestion. Okay, well, um, I'd like to um, ask everyone to give a round of applause to our three panelists, three speakers. Thank you.